I'd like to start with a bit of um, scene setting and a bit of background information. So when we think about decarmization, decarmizing our country as a whole and our net zero targets, the decarmization of building operation and of and in particular heating those buildings uh, plays a key role in how we're going to meet those uh, net zero carbon targets. And when we open up the, um, the puzzle of heat decarbonisation, uh, the performance of building fabric is really central to how we solve that puzzle. And when I talk about building fabric performance, I'm talking about how leaky our homes are, how airtight they are, and also the insulating properties of windows, doors, external walls, roofs, etc. And these concepts aren't particularly new or, or groundbreaking as awareness of environmental issues has grown over the last few decades. So have the standards to which we build our homes and houses. And um, we've also become familiar with the idea of retrofitting measures to improve building fabric performance, such as installing loft insulation and cavity wall insulation. So whilst these concepts are particularly groundbreaking, there is a um, growing body of recent research conducted by staff at Leeds Beckett University and other institutions that has identified a performance gap between how we expect our building fabric to perform, how it's designed to perform, and how it actually performs in situ in constructed buildings. And the reasons for this performance gap can be hard to pinpoint specifically and are unique to each each building. They can include low levels of uh, quality of work or a lack of attention to detail uh, regarding that continuity of insulation and air tightness. But more central to the cause of performance gap is a lack of measuring performance in situ to verify that it is as we expect. And it's this measurement or, or lack of measurement um, that is quite central to my research. And we'll explore that a bit further in this presentation. So building fabric performance, we can characterize this and quantify this in many, many different ways. We can measure the air permeability of buildings, which tells us how much uncontrolled air passes through though. And we can also look at the specific U values of elements such as windows or doors. Um, but what's quite holistic is to look at a whole house performance. And to do that, we talk about the HTC or the heat transfer coefficient. And this is a unique way of um, characterizing building performance that tells us how much heat we need to put into a building to maintain a comfortable internal temperature in respect of the external temperature. And a lot of people liken this metric to a miles per gallon rating for a car. <clears throat> so for a given period of the year or for a given journey in a car, uh, the amount of energy that each will consume will vary on, on the occupants of the house, how hot they like their heating, and the driver of the car, how quickly they accelerate and decelerate. But overall, it's largely dictated by this value, the HTC. So this value is used in building regulations and in EPCs. So it's used to rank our housing stock on um, how efficient the fabric is. But in this application, the HTC is, is not measured, it's predicted based on ideal values of relating to building fabric performance or design values. So currently, there's no regulatory requirement to measure the HTC. This is one reason why it doesn't routinely happen um, in, in buildings. But another reason is that the traditional methods of measuring HTC aren't suitable for mainstream applications as we will now talk about in a bit more detail. So I'll now describe two ways in which you can measure the HTC of a building, one that's um, quite well established and one that's a bit more new on the scene. So first up is the coheating test. So the coheating test um, originated in the 1980s, originally for the purposes of commissioning air conditioning systems, but it's had a bit of a resurgence. It's popular again in the last two decades um, for the purpose of measuring the HTCs of buildings. And some of the staff here at Leeds Beckett University 
have been quite central to really optimizing the procedure and, and standardizing it. And um, yeah, the procedure is as follows, really, very roughly. So the internal temperature of a building is elevated to 25 degrees C for a period of two weeks or more. And this is done using electric heaters of known efficiency. And throughout this period, where the building is unoccupied, we measure the energy demand of these heaters, the internal and external temperatures, and also how much solar radiation is incident on the house in this time. And we also might monitor some of the other climactic factors, such as wind speed um, and precipitation. And then after this monitoring period, we can use the data collected to conduct a energy balance and determine the HTC of the building. So this procedure is very, very well respected in research and academic fields. Um, it's seen as quite a reliable and robust method. However, because of this duration of two weeks or even more in some instances, it hasn't really made its way outside of that academic research sphere. You can imagine a um, construction manager on a housing estate with a type program to meet isn't going to be very happy if they've got to find an extra two or three weeks in their program to conduct this testing on all their houses. So that's one of the, uh, one of the drawbacks to it. So next up, Cube. So this is the focus of my PhD, and it's a relatively new method that's been developed by Sangaban. And the outline procedure of the Cube measurement um, is as follows. So it takes place overnight. And the reason for this is there's no solar radiation occurring. Um, and it consists of two distinct phases of equal length. So first, we subject the house to a constant heat input phase. And then we remove the heat input, and it's subject to a free cooling phase. And what we're interested in here is the thermal response of the building. So how quickly it heats up and how quickly it cools down. And of course, we want to measure the external temperatures as well, which will be driving that temperature change as well. And by measuring these uh, thermal responses to both phases, we can infer the HTC using uh, calculations. So this duration of a single night gives it a clear advantage over the coheating test and potentially makes it a more practical and convenient test to um, to conduct in those mainstream applications, such as large scale retrofit projects or new build construction. So it's, a re as I said, a relatively new procedure, uh, but Sangaban, who are its, um, its developers and, and other institutions have conducted a number of studies to sort of validate the uh, procedure and um, determine how well it works. And the results of these studies are shown on the slide here, where each pair of lines is a different property or a different performance configuration of a property, so different levels of insulation. And the blue bar shows the result from a coheating test and the orange bar from a cube measurement. So we can see in all instances, they are comparable to some degree. And across all the published studies, there's about a 10% difference between the two measurement techniques. Uh, however, we can see in some, they're sort of neck and neck, no real apparent difference. And some, there's a bit more of a step difference. So there's work to be done to explore why those differences are occurring and what steps we can take to either understand those or minimize those. So these studies do a couple of things. They validate the method, they show that it works in principle and in practice for a number of different house types. And they provide a really solid body of knowledge to, to build on and develop the procedure further. And this really lays the bedrock for my PhD study. So my PhD will use a case study method. Um, so we'll be conducting cube tests and comparisons to coheating tests in the field, in real houses, um, coming up against all the obstacles and variables that we would come up if we were doing it for real. And we are interested in the accuracy of the method, so how true it is, how close the results are to the true HDC of a building, and the precision of the method. 
So what is the spread of the results when we do repeated tests? And it will focus in on uh, three main research areas. So firstly, the test boundary conditions. So what's going on outside of the, test, of the house we're testing? And how does this impact the results? For example, what's the external temperature? What are the wind speeds? And how much solar radiation was incident the day before that's potentially stored in the fabric? And what steps can we take to understand how these will impact on the result of the cube test? Second, the characteristic of the test building. So how does the built form and the construction of the building that we're testing behave in the cube test? For example, we know that very leaky buildings, the, um, the heat loss through these is more liable to fluctuate with changing temperatures and high wind speeds. And also for houses with adjoining properties, such as semi-detached and terraced buildings, the heating patterns of our neighbors here will affect how much heat's flowing into the building. So we need to take account of this and uh, include it in the test procedure. And thirdly, disaggregating the HTC. So having the HTC, this whole house um, performance metric is a wonderful way to characterize uh, a building's fabric performance. But there are some instances when having a bit more of a granular view of heat loss in a property um, is advantageous and useful. For example, if we're designing retrofit measures, we, uh, as an architect or as a designer, we might want to know where's best investing our resources and money. Is it more heat loss being lost through the walls or through the windows? And having that more granular view of an HTC can be really great to inform those decisions. So I'm pleased to say that working with um, the Leeds Sustainability Institute, who are part of Leeds Beckett University, that we've already conducted some tests um, in, in recent months. We've got some great data that's really going to help us open up these research areas and um, contribute to our PhD. So in, in summary then, we've spoke about how decarbonizing heat is really a, a necessary step to our nation's decarbonization targets, and how central to that is building fabric performance. However, a performance gap between the design and ideal performance of building fabric and what we actually see in constructions is threatened to undermine these targets by giving us buildings with worse performance than what we need to reach net zero and what we expect through the design. And a lack of measurement to verify performance is potentially contributing to this performance gap. Um, this is driven by current techniques which aren't well suited for mainstream applications. However, the CUBE method has potential to be widely adopted, practical test method, uh, suitable for those mainstream commercial applications, not just the research sector. And then the body of research that's been conducted already creates a really nice body of work for my PhD to build on and uh, explore the accuracy and the precision of the cube method by conducting field case studies. So uh, that's my presentation. Thank you very much uh, for listening. And I look forward to some Q&A at some point soon. Thank you.